It is a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Rami Gamil all the way from Cairo, Egypt. It is just so darn cool that I can wake up in Phoenix, Arizona and talk to a dentist in Cairo. How cool is that? That's super cool. Same here, uh, Howard. I, I'm glad that the internet is making everything uh, smaller and closer. It is. It's just like the whole yeah. world is just one little town, a small town. Dr. Yes. Rami Gamil, BDS, F-I-C-O-I-D-U, University, Tolulese, third. Rami Gamil received his Diplomat University, DU, in 3D imaging from the University of Tolulese in France. His main area of interest in is research in digital dentistry, computer-aided implantology, image-guided and computer-guided surgery, 3D smile analysis, and published author in JPD, JOI, and other articles. His main focus is the use of CBCT, 3D imaging, computer-aided implant surgery, 3D smile analysis, CAD CAM, and rapid prototyping in dentistry. He is a current member of the Computer-Aided Implantology Academy, an active member of the International Digital Dentistry Society, and member of its Data Acquisition Council. Dr. Gamil teaches at the first Digital Dentistry Master Program, organized by the Department of Surgical and Morphological Sciences, University of Insuburia, Baris, Italy. He is also the CEO and founder of 3D Vision Company, an advanced training center for 3D imaging, 3D printing, computer-guided surgery, and dental digital dentistry solutions. He is also CEO and co-founder of 3D Vision Imaging, total digital Im maxillofacial imaging centers offering the full range of digital CBCT, face, intraoral, lab scanning, 3D printing, and digital dentistry workflows and services. He does personally 3D CBCT scans, treatment plans, OMFR reports, surgical guide fabrication, lecturing workshops, and live surgeries in computer implantology and digital dentistry locally and internationally. Wow, you're a busy man. Thank Holy you, Howard. Holy. That's a long introduction, but thank you. <laughs> I, I almost, I'm now I'm too tired to do the rest of the interview. That is, uh, yeah, so it's... We can it's uh, so what so how little were you how young were you when you first got excited into computers because obviously you uh something happened to you with technology when you were a little kid was it a uh, nintendo 64 uh, it was way before my brother had the sinclair computer do you remember those ones yes Th that was back in the, i don't know the early 90s and we used to put uh, tapes in them and the tapes run to record and to install the, the game and you stay for 15 minutes uh, so that you can play a, a very basic game that today is nothing uh, related to uh, today's technology. And I, I always like to play with computers and I remember uh, destroying the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, that, that was the way to know what was inside and then going forward. So I assume you're going to say that dentistry is all going from impressions and analog all to digital. Uh, I can say yes and no, because this is where the technology is heading. Uh, right now in today's economy, the smartphones, the iPads and everything, they are, they are like part of your body. You wake up in the morning, you check them before everything, you say you look at your iPhone before or, or whatever smartphone you have before you go to sleep. So the same is happening with dentistry. Uh, going digital, having uh, quicker workflows, uh, but the question again and again that th there will be this uh, tension between analog or traditional ways and digital is uh, the price, uh, the, the accuracy, and how easy it, it is it to be incorporated in everyday workflow. So these are questions that are yet to be settled in the literature and also in the day-to-day -day, uh, work. Well, you know, um, having lived you know, 53 years, I've seen a lot of technologies and all that kind of stuff, but the iPhone was the mm -hmm. first technology that I noticed that, you know, you would start to leave the house and you'd get in the car and other people in the car say, oh, wait a minute, I forgot my iPhone. I mean, it was it was the first thing that was part of their body. Yes. You know, I've seen people get in the cars and leave their laptops, PCs, I, you know, yeah. everything. But you but people just won't leave without their smartphone i mean it's actually a part of their brain it's an extension of their brain carried in their hand exactly i think that's, that's i think today's economy <laughs> i think i think the next step is they'll start inserting it into our brain chips <laughs> yeah chips galore so um what would you well you know i always say the litmus test is anything new has got to be faster easier higher in quality but lower in cost and a lot of a lot of solutions like I was I was kind of um, 
upset with Invisalign when they come out because I thought, man, this is great. It was faster, mm. easier, higher in quality, but it was more expensive. Mm. And so, so what, what is, what in digital are you excited about that is faster, easier, higher in quality, lower cost? Because I believe you should keep one eye on your patient and use mm. your brain uh, to keep the keep the other eye on cost and use your brain to drive down costs until your patients have the freedom to afford what we do for them. So, what what, what do you think is a bleeding edge versus leading edge? What, what what technology do you think is there now? I think the technology that we all in dentistry should look for is the three D printing technology, the editing manufacturing, because. The intraoral scanners, they have been there for, for a while. Okay, th there is talk about the accuracies when it comes to full arch and still many are working on that. But 3D printing, I think, is the cutting edge because literally, I always like to say that in my lecture, my presentations and everything, that whatever you can 3D model, you can 3D print today. So the limit is the sky. You can think of any design, whether uh, something related to implants, to orthodontics, maxillofacial, uh, or, or even something that you want to manufacture in your clinic and you can, if you know what you're doing, you can model it, you can send to the printer, the printer uh, prints and again, uh, it, there is a learning curve, this is always what I say, there is a learning curve to get uh, the know-how of the software and of the hardware but I think 3D printing or additive manufacturing is uh, something to look for uh, in the years to come. And why are you more excited about 3D printing as opposed to the opposite CAD CAM where you start to block and reduce? Why, why does printing up excite you more than milling down? Okay, because for me, if you compare printing to milling, uh, pr printing is able to, to manufacture structures that are much, much, much more complex than a 5-axis milling machine, for example. Because there is always the limitation that you, if, for example, you have a long tube uh, hollow with certain angulation that's not easy to mill for example if you have something with a severe angulation uh, you cannot mill if you have something with uh, that is very thin like veneers for example uh, they can break on the milling machine even the most accurate ones while in printing there is no limitation of the size of the complexity of the angulations and I think what will uh, right now the printers are not able to be mainstream in printing ceramics Okay, and this is where the edge of the milling now. You, you, you have to mill uh, ceramics and not print them. But when the technology and, and many companies that I know are working on the R&D of ceramic printing, if when this picks up, I think the, the milling technology will be threatened a little bit. Now, in my mouth, I only have seven restorations. They're all gold inlays and onlays. Do you, do you think uh, printing, I mean, they would never mill down gold because there'd be too much high-cost waste. Do you think you'll ever mill up gold or precious metal inlays and onlays? You mean print, not mill? Yeah, print. Uh, right now, there is, there is metal printing, which is called uh, laser sintering or uh, selective laser melting where you start with a powder of a metal, like for example titanium uh, or, uh, or whatever type of alloy that they use according to the application, and the laser uh, beam draws the layer and it melts the powder and centers it into something solid, and then you build another layer and another layer. So today it's possible. I don't know if, if gold is doable, but titanium, yes, uh, cobalt chromium, yes, and other stuff. Well, you know, I always thought when you're, um, you know, you remove a tooth, and then yeah. we have to take a drill bit to make a hole to fit our implant. I always wondered if someday we'll pull the tooth, scan it, and then and then print out a titanium exact replacement, whether it be for a hip, a joint, a knee, and then put in a titanium that was exactly the same three-dimensional shape as the tooth, the hip, the knee. Do you think that's uh, around the corner? That, that happened already. <laughs> like, there are many papers and research on customized uh, laser center titanium implants where uh, you just scan even the patient before extraction you segment or what you mean by segment is separate you take virtually the root out of the bone and you uh, design your implant you add for example an abutment on top or how do you want to, your immersion pro profile to look great and then you send to the laser centering machine and it manufactures it and then if you want to do some surface treatment and then it goes inside the patient by tapping. So this was the limitation a little bit. Not many people like the tapping versus uh, screwing. So it's 
It happened. Does it need improvement? Yes. Uh, is it mainstream? Not yet. So, so what? Um, what three? If someone is listening to you and said yeah. they wanted to, uh, they wanted to buy a three D printer. What? What yeah. names or brands? What? What? What do you think is? Uh, what would you recommend? Okay, three uh, D printing. Uh, you have uh, from the needle to the rocket, like we say in Egypt. This is what we call. It. So there are very expensive, high end industrial machines that are have uh, high accuracy, different range of uh, printing material. And then you have simpler ones that can be uh, as low as 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 US dollars. Uh, me personally, uh, I, I use several. Uh, I, I used to use a, an industrial uh, or a mid-range machine, which is Envision Tech from Germany. Uh, it's, it's a very good, very accurate one, and it was used for jewelry first. So for me, uh, it's, it's much more accurate than what's in the market now. Recently, a lot of patents of the main companies have ended, so another, other players are going inside the, the market. Uh, what is good, what is bad in printing, I always say don't ever buy a printer from what the seller gives you in a catalog, for example, or tells you that the resolution is, is that or this or that. You have to test yourself, you have to uh, send the company samples, make sure that this is printed on that machine, and when you're satisfied, so this is a good printer. Because the printing, if not uh, uh, reliable, if not repeatable, it's going to be a mess and you won't like it. And then people start and say, okay, I'll go back to the conventional ways. You know, um, a lot of dentists in the United States are afraid that dentistry is going uh, corporate. You know, instead of owning your own office, you're working for a chain. They, they have right now 12 to 14% of the dentists work for a chain. But mm -hmm. when we look at the uh, – there's only 211,000 dentists in the United States. When we look at the 1 million physicians, what drove group practice was all these expensive MRIs and CAT scans and ultrasounds. Um, mm -hmm. So do, do you think to maintain um, solo practicing dentists that we should uh, just use uh, a lab? Because if a dentist has to buy a printer, a CVCT, a CAD cam mm – -hmm. Then, then that's forcing group practice. I mean, you can't really buy all that stuff and practice by yourself, yes. can you? Yes. You, you know, Howard, uh, it depends. From what I've seen around the world, it depends on the country where you are practicing. Because in some economies, doctors can't afford to have the CBCT, the intraoral scanners, the CAT cam, the printers, uh, the sintering ovens and everything in one place. And they can have the production that can pay that back somehow or another. In other economies, in other countries uh, uh, who cannot afford, usually the model is uh, someone doing a center like, like we are doing and other refer. They outsource. They don't need to have all the equipment. They can have one part of the chain or, or two or three, uh, but we offer the, the full solution. So you, you can send us for CBCT scan, intraoral scan. Uh, uh, designing whatever appliance you want uh, uh, for implants, surgical guides. We, we offer the whole solution. A smart design, for example, with photography or today we use 3D, 3D face scans, which I believe is an improvement for smart design also, uh, not just using the re regular 3D photographs and older limitation, and that's a big subject today. Uh, and, and I'm going to lecture about that in, uh, in NYU with Dental XP soon also. Yeah. Um, I got to ask you another question that young kids, sure. you know, the, the um, a lot of dentists are saying, uh, Rami, is buying a printer or a CBCT or a CAD cam, is it kind of like buying an iPhone? I mean, nobody, nobody wants to keep their iPhone more than five years because then the new model is so much better. I, is it kind of silly to buy a CBCT where you're locked in on a 10-year lease or, or are you thinking in your head, well, I'll buy this and I'll own it for 20 years when the truth of the matter is? I mean, do, do you think – a lot of these fancy toys are kind of outdated in five years, like an iPhone. Uh, for cone beam CT scanners, I think not big changes have happened in the last 10 years. Uh, some minor changes, so their the lifespan is a little big. Uh, how, how long do you think the lifespan of a CBCT would be? Uh, 10 years. 10 years, five okay. Ten. Yeah, 5 to 10. Okay, what about a CAD cam? Uh, a CAD cam... Uh, I would say in the current economy, I would give it two years. From one IDS to another, that's what I call it. Because One IDS to another. 
I love it. I know you're on top of the game when you make, when you say that. Explain but, your but viewers again, what that but is. Again, people, people that I know have CAT cams that have been more than that. They can still function. But if you want another edge, something newer, so that's two years. So what um, Rami just said, if you're not on a, an international uh, lecture scene, is that the biggest meeting in Europe is uh, every other year. It's two years apart. It's in Cologne, Germany. And yes. there's no other meeting in the entire world like it. I mean, you literally, literally, literally have over 100,000 dentists from every country on earth. And a lot of the big companies, they all plan their product launches for the IDS meeting. So yes. they, 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 at the IDS meeting in Cologne, which you have to go, I think Cologne, Germany is one of the coolest cities in the world. It was, it was the farthest Western outpost of the Roman Empire, and they still have Roman walls around there. But all the companies – are telling you about their new product, and then they're listening to all the Ramis of the world, uh, and then they're going to go back, and they got two years to do what you asked for. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, from one IDS cycle to another. Uh, I call I, I never miss an IDS, and I call it the World Cup. You cannot miss the World Cup. <laughs> now the World Cup's every four years, right? Yeah, but in dentistry it's two. <laughs> but in dentistry it's two. So the World Cup in dentistry is the IDS, and it's every two years. By the way, I didn't understand that saying you said. You said um, in your country they say from the needle to the rocket. What's the needle? What's that mean, yes. the needle to the rocket? It, it means that it, it, there is a big spectrum. Starting from you, you can own a needle and, and use it till you can own a rocket and everything that's in between. Rocket is top of the technology. Needle is something very basic, uh, basic uh, not expensive, and everything in between. This is what this uh, uh, saying means. You got uh, it? Or? Since you said rocket, I have to ask you one completely batshit crazy question about your country <laughs> that at least, I would say at least a quarter of the Americans, seriously, yeah. I, I've seen this in polls, believe that the pyramid technology was from aliens. What would you say to the American, and a lot of dentists are conspiracy believers, what would you say, be, and they have all this proof that, you know, that uh, they still don't know how to make them today, it, it was alien. What would you say to a dentist who uh, asked you, did aliens help build those pyramids? I tell him, uh, you've been watching uh, a good bunch of sci-fi movies. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. And uh, number two, uh, there are other evidences that say that they can be built. And since we don't know, uh, that's being scientific. If we don't know, we don't claim. You have to prove the other way. So both arguments have their uh, pros and cons, and not, none of them is 100% for sure. But I don't think aliens did it because uh, I think that they were very advanced at that time. That's well, what would be what? I mean, you're a smart guy, and you live in Cairo. What What is your best guess on how they uh, stack those rocks that high? What 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 is your best guess on that? Uh, I'm not an archaeologist, but uh, when I was young, I went to uh, I went to the uh, the Egyptian museum many times with my father, which he was uh, into that more, and uh, they said that they uh, they built ramps and with certain inclinations, and they would move the rocks. And then do a layer and then build another lamp with another angulation and go around and build another layer until they are uh, all over the top. That is amazing. And how many years did it take to make them? Uh, a lot. A long, more, long time? More, 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 more than uh, two mill a crown. <laughs> okay, so, so if, if someone listening to you wanted to buy their first printer, what, what, what's your first printer? What would you recommend? Uh, it depends on the budget. For me, uh, I would go for, because I, I'm production center, I have uh, big uh, numbers to, 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 to give to my customers. So I need something that is, uh, won't jam, uh, quick, accurate range of printing that is a lot. So for me, I would advise uh, the Envision Tech or something in that rate. Envision Tech is I N. Envision to, is it I in, envision with an I or envision with an e? with an E? Oh, envision. with an E. Envision Tech is from Germany. Okay, and that's and what that's what I use. And uh, what did that I cost think, you? I bought it uh, two years ago. It was around fifty thousand euros. Fifty thousand wow. euros. And how long do you think that's going to last? Uh, for me, it's a power horse. It will last a while. The technology now will offer other cheaper standards. So if I want to get other ones, it's okay. I can get cheaper ones. Uh, but for me, this will be like the main uh, center of my production. 
But I mean, do you, do you think it's going to last 10 years? Uh, no. How many years do you think it'll last? Five. Five, okay. And then um, talk about intro scanning. Um, you know, yeah. on, on the one hand, you got this, uh, you know, I've been, I've been using 3M's, uh, at, well, it used to be SV Impergum, then 3M bought it, but I've been using Impergum since 1984. You weren't even yeah. born in 84, were you? <laughs> well, what year I were was, you born? I was, I was one year. You were one year old, so I uh, I started using Impergum in celebration of Rami's birthday, and um, you know, so so the good thing about that is, you know, what what does an impression cost? Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen bucks total. But at fifty three, what I like about my oral scanner is, with fifty three year old eyes, I like seeing the impression up on the screen forty times larger. But if you're, uh, you know, if you were um, a kid. You know, if you were under 30 and your eyes still work, so what's the um, what do you, what do you think the, the explain what do you think the trade off is between an impression with a polyvinyl slock sign or impergum versus buying a scanner, and what scanner would you buy and why? Okay, I would say the following, and, and this is what I noticed lately when we, when people uh, over talk about digital dentistry, you need like everything else to go the conventional way first. That's my opinion. If you're still learning. You need to learn manual uh, endodontic in my in my mind, and then you go to the rotary and everything like that. So you need to uh, know how to do proper preparations first, how to do retraction, how to take regular impressions, because this is what you're building here, and, and this is gonna transfer from analog to digital. If you go to digital and you don't have this built, you're having good tools, but you're getting very very bad results. So you need to have this in your mind first. So. Regular impressions are still there, and they can still be used when there are limitations of the scanners. For example, today there is the big debate of using the intraoral scanners for full arch, whether uh, to, to match a model in guided surgery or uh, to do uh, full arch uh, restorations over implants or full arch bridge, for example. Uh, some companies say that our scanner is there, it can do it. And uh, others claim, and when you try them, it doesn't work. For me, I don't have a final answer yet. I need to have a, a, a workflow that, that has both. I need to be able to take conventional impressions when the, 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 the scanner doesn't work well. But for me, the edge of the scanner is uh, uh, speed, and I will put, again, a, note, a side note here. Because at the beginning, when you buy an intraoral scanner, it's not going to be faster than your impression you will be having a new tool in your hand. You need to know how to use it, how to do proper retraction of the soft tissues, especially when you're working with the lower, the tongue and everything. It's not gonna be as easy as it is shown in commercials. So at first there is the learning curve. And after you gain speed, you need to be able to know the scanning strategy of the scanner, because if you do it in the wrong way, you will get, again, bad results. Garbage in, garbage out, same as everything in computers. So uh, I would like to use an intraoral scanner and have also, I won't throw my impression material away because there will be some instances when I need to take an impression conventionally, especially when it comes uh, to full arch uh, implant restorations. And what uh, intraoral scanner would you buy? Uh, today, you are asking me questions that will make a little bit that uh, will go to like advertising, but I... No, I, no, I, 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 I don't... I don't um... I don't see it as advertising. I don't see it as advertising because I um, the, the the people listen to this. They always send me emails, Howard at dentaltown.com, and one of my biggest complaints is that um, they're not mentioning brands or names. And what I okay. see with the internet is uh, what when I started Dental Town in 1998, the mission was that no dentist would ever have to practice solo again, and they would rather hear it from you because you're you you're absolutely the number one rock star uh, from Egypt. I mean, everybody that I know. From the in that whole region, um, all all the way down. I mean, the whole northern Africa, the Middle East. You're you're the man, and they really want to know exactly what you're thinking. And let me and let me before you answer, let me say one thing about commercials. Um, hmm. These companies hire MBAs, masters in business administration, and I got an MBA. And you, the whole deal of a commercial is that you take your number one complaint and you spin it. Like, for instance, have you heard, do they have Raisin Bran in uh, in Egypt, Raisin, post-Raisin Bran? Yes, I, I like Raisin Bran. Yeah, <laughs> there's no raisins in Raisin Bran, so what do they advertise? There's two scoops of raisins in every box. Um, German and Japanese cars never, ever advertise about a warranty because their cars work. American cars 
or a piece of shit Chevy, Chrysler, Ford. So all their advertisements are, hey, we have a 100,000 mile warranty from bumper to bumper. Yeah, you're saying you have a warranty because your car sucks. So when you said that um, that the company was saying how fast it was, that should be your first clue that, oh, so it's not fast, it's slow. Whenever a company says, hey, Rami, buy my product because it's red, well, then you know it ain't red, you know it's blue. I mean, it's just, if they say, hey, you can throw this real high. Yeah, what's that? You need to think it twice and see it for yourself. <laughs> well, well, but you you really need to be, you really should think to yourself, okay, they could have advertised 100 features of this product. And they're formally trained to advertise and promote their worst feature. So if something says, oh, this is very cost efficient for your practice, you should think, shit, this is really expensive. I'm going to raise my overhead. They say, hey, this will make you go faster. You're, you should be thinking, I wonder why this is going to slow me down. Because they advertise their worst case feature that their competitors are selling against them. So sorry about that. But no, they want to know what Rami okay. wants for an oral scan. Okay, I, I will tell you my opinion, uh, uh, not in a politically correct way. I'll tell you what I really think. Okay, that's good? Good, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, so for me, uh, the scanners that are that I have used or have access to is the Plan Scan from Plan Mecca, which was E4D. Okay, uh, Trios from 3Shape. Uh, Serec from uh, Sirona, the Omnicam, and uh, Kerstream, CS3500. I haven't seen the 3600 3, 3, yet. So for me, the pros and cons of each quickly. Uh, I think that 3 shape uh, has an edge now in the speed and accuracy from what I tried, but I need to do more tests. But this is my impression right now. It's not evidence-based, it's my experience. But uh, 3Shape is, is what they call the Lamborghini. It's the best, but it's the most expensive right now. So it's not easy for everybody to have. The second thing is they have the yearly license. So every year you have to pay a yearly license of around 1,500 euros plus or minus, or else your scanner won't work. So that's the that's part. From th that's from 3Shape? Yes, that's 3Shape. If we go to uh, Sirona, the Omnicam is uh, a very good uh, scanner that has been there for years, but uh, there is the closed system. Recently, they started to have options where you can export the STLs, but again, it needs to be quicker than that to catch up with what everybody else is doing. Uh, if we go to Kerstream, Kerstream takes more or less still shots, the one that I saw, the 3500. They say the newer one has improved. I haven't seen it personally. Uh, so it's a bit slow uh, and heavy in my hands. Uh, Plan Scan has improved a lot. I saw the, the earlier versions of it, which was like very, very slow and very hard, and uh, it couldn't remember its uh, position easily. Uh, right now, it has it became faster in my hands. Um, they, they are releasing a color tip also, and uh, the price is, uh, is is good. And the annual license uh, is not. Uh, there, in, in my region at least. I don't know if it's like that in the US or Europe. Uh, but I still have questions related when I scan full arch with it. So this is my experience with each scanner. Now doesn't 3M SV have one also? Yes, uh, 3M has one. It's called True Definition. But I haven't used 3M. I have friends uh, that lecture about it, that use it. Uh, I, I saw that it's black and white. Uh, I'm not sure if it takes powder or not, and that's something. When, when, you, when you choose a scanner, you need to check. Does it do live video streaming? I, I, I like the live video streaming ones. Uh, does it use powder or not? I like the powder-free ones. Uh, does it scan in color? That's not a big deal for me, but okay, that might be an edge for the patient. He would like to see his teeth in color. For me, I need it to be accurate more than to be colored. Uh, is it open or not? Uh, easily export the STL or any design uh, on it. That's very important uh, part for me. Uh, the price and the annual license. Uh, these are how you choose your scanner, in my opinion. What about um um. What what about maintenance? Are are a lot of these uh, breaking down or needing a lot of maintenance? Do you, do you, are some cheaper because they? Uh, I mean, like. Like if you're an American, you, you you know if you buy a car from Japan or Germany, it's going to work. If you buy it from the United States, it needs to come with a full-time mechanic. Um, have you have you noticed any issues on the uh, the long-term cost because of uh, high maintenance, or they uh, under warranties or? The the tips 
of the scanners. Uh, sometimes if you sterilize them and not uh, in, a, in a good way, they lose their mirrors in the end. So uh, by time, if they lose their reflection, you need to replace them. So that's one part that you need to replace and need to maintain well. Uh, the cables and the connections, the more you have cables and connections, again, like everything, like your iPhone charger, like uh, I have an issue with the scanner that I have right now with the cable and it needs to go back to the mother company to be changed. So it happens. And you know, that, that that's a big part of it. I mean, even in some in an old technology, like a, a machine gun, the Russian AK-47 only has three moving parts and the American M-16 has four moving parts. Just that extra moving part means a 25% extra breakdown and around the I, world everyone would still prefer uh, an AK-47. Um, I, I agree. Have, I, I have four boys so we have uh, at least three or four of those in the house just uh, just, <laughs> just, just, just for fun. Um, so um, so you all, you mentioned um, uh, Serona, uh, Densplice Serona's uh, CIRAC and you mentioned um, PlanScan. Both those companies Densply Serona has probably the 80% of the market share of CAD cams in the United States. And then um, um, E4D out of Dallas was bought by uh, um, um, Plan Mecca at a Helsinki, yes. Finland. Uh, what, what do you think of CAD cam in general? Because a lot, and what I mean by this, well, I mean, is a lot of kids come out of school in America, they're $350,000 in debt. So they open up this practice, and these machines are big bucks. And they're sitting there thinking, you know, should I should I just take an impression, send it to the lab? And you said when you're starting out, you need to you need to perfect the analog. You need to perfect preps yes. and temporaries and impressions. Yes. You need to get your basics down. It's like like you need to play acoustic guitar before you get to electric guitar. But when but after they've um, after they've done that, do you think uh, do you think CAD CAM is worth the money? I mean, it's a big chunk of change, and they got a lot of student loans. That's a, a very hard question. <laughs> no, it's not. I have to tell the truth. I know you know the answer. Okay, because there are two types of CAD CAM right now. There, is, there are the chair side ones and the lab ones. And uh, the chair side, there are ranges of, of prices. Some are more expensive than the others. And the lab ones are getting more and more uh, affordable, but they are slower. So if you want to do a chair side crown in one appointment, so the chair side machine will mill faster what you want, but it won't mill everything. So uh, according uh, to answer that question, you need to know uh, how many patients uh, you, you, you will see and like everything, the return on investment, after how many patients you are gonna get back that money that you uh, you pay. And that's, a, that's, that's again, that's a spectrum. Someone can do it in one year, two years, three years, four years. But, but it's a heavy uh, investment, I agree. It's not something that you go, and throw your money without thinking. <laughs> and and a and um an intermediate step because I know a lot of people who bought CAD CAM and now <laughs> the only thing they used it for is the oral scanning because it, it was they weren't um, prepping, impressing, milling, and seating a crown in an hour. They weren't doing it in two hours. It was taking three, four, sometimes five. And you know their assistants only made fifty crowns in their life, and the lab man's made five thousand. Uh, so do you, do you think a, a oral scanner is kind of an intermediate step between uh, to going from impression to digital without having to, to mill it in-house? Uh, yes and no. Yes, again, because uh, you won't need to buy the whole system. You will need something, you, you will buy something that is uh, more affordable. But at the same time, you don't have control over the whole chain of production. So whenever, this is what I saw, whenever an error happens, the clinician blames the lab and the lab blames the clinician. Like same with regular impression. He tells him, you didn't send me a correct impression and the other guy said he didn't do a good work. So if you have the whole production, that's an edge. Okay, it needs extra personnel uh, and you need to know what you're doing from A to Z, but you'll have control over the final product that you get in your office. If you send it to a lab, there will be trial and error. You need to, to try this person and the other one and see if, if, if he works well with you, he understands you, and this needs a very good communication, in my opinion. Um, are there are there basically only two CAD-CAN systems now? Is it basically Densefly, Serona, Serac, and Plan Mecca Z4D? Are there, yeah. are there, is there a, any third one in the market that you're aware of that's, uh, uh, that's, that's penetrating uh, the market? Th there are people that do the combos. 
they would buy a scanner that is open, like uh, for example, plant scan from Planeca, uh, three shape, uh, three M true definition, and they would buy a regular milling machine or, or, or two milling machines, one wet and one dry or a, or a hybrid. And he, he does his own chair side system. So this is, this is the third model that is emerging, but again, it needs people uh, that can uh, tolerate the pain of making everything work together at the beginning. Yeah, the advantage of the closed system uh, with uh, uh, Densefly, Serona, Serac is that it is more user friendly. I mean, it's simpler. Uh, it's simpler to I, figure I, out. I'm not a fan of closed systems, but sometimes, unfortunately, <laughs> closed systems are more tweaked. Although, when you buy even a Serac, there is the learning curve. You won't go in the first time, take a correct impression, you mill, and you have the perfect crown. There is again the tweaking. You need to know the parameters, how to scan well, the parameters of the design, the parameters of the milling. The same will go for an open system. So it will it will depend on your ability to learn, on how easy things merge together, and your support. Support is very important. If you have the best machine without good support, you're in trouble. <laughs> so if one of my listeners is saying, "Okay, uh, come on, Rami, name a name. Should I should I get the Serac or should I get the E4D from Plan Mega? Which one do you like more?" I will tell them, ask Howard. <laughs> no. Uh, come on, come on. E four D E four D is in uh, in uh, Helsinki, Finland, and uh, and Sarone is in Germany. So you they got to cross the Mediterranean to go find Rami. So uh, you're you're no, you're, it's, it's not it's not about that. But uh, again, everything is not simplistic. You cannot right. say a simplistic answer to very complex questions. You cannot just say this is good, this is bad, or you will be I, I won't be a man of science if I say that. I, I won't be uh, honest. I will be biased some way. So for me, these are the two players, yes, for now, that offer full range of chair side systems. Again, you have to answer these questions. You have to check the plan scan and the Omnicam. Or Sirona has the Omnicam, the Blue Cam, and the Apollo DI. They have three scanners, not one. So Name uh, them again. The, oh, they have the what? Yeah. They, same. They have the Omnicam, which is the color, the most recent one, the smallest. They have the, the blue cam, and they have the Apollo DI, which is a low-cost, uh, smaller scanner that, that uses power. On the other hand, Plan Mecca uh, have one scanner, which is the Plan Scan. Uh, another thing is the Sirona. Uh, it has uh, one tip, Plan Mac has three tips depending on the size of the mouse, so the more you have a bigger tip, you scan faster, but the more you go posterior, you cannot use it easily. That's another thing. Uh, uh, Plan Mac has uh, uh, black and white, and now they're introducing the colored, and the upgrade is just to change the tip. Uh, when it comes to sterilization, the tips of Plan Mac can go into uh, cold or, uh, or autoclave sometimes, and th that depends uh, on, on what they were exposed to. Uh, Sirona cannot go into the autoclave because uh, the, the camera is in the tip, so you cannot, if you put it, it will be damaged. Uh, what else? Uh, Speed-wise, uh, I think the Omnicam has, is a bit faster, to say. Um, accuracy, you need to test more. You need to test more and have literature, not Rami opinion, let's say. We did 100 scans with this and that, with the gold standard, and then we can say, and and, and not company-sponsored uh, study. So you you were saying that the color was more uh, a pizzazz for the patient, not really technical for the doctor. Uh, sometimes it helps you to detect the margin well because it shows you where is the soft tissue. But I'm a man of open system. I use ha ha yeah, like a lot of software, a lot of scanners, a lot of stuff. So I need everything to move from with fluidity from one place to another. So uh, the STL is not colored. You see, the STL is a file format for the, 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 the 3D object that is not colored. It doesn't have color embedded into it. Uh, PLY, for example, is another file extension that has the color. OBJ for the face scans, for example, the 3D face scan, where I can scan Howard and see him in 3D, <laughs> and I can make Howard smile. And, and uh, you know, for smile design, for example, we take the photos, but sometimes it's not easy to take them accurately, so the 3D scan can help to move and, and measure accurately more than photos, for example, and that's something we're working on right now. Uh, so uh, for me, the color 
um, is not a very important thing. For others, yes. And some scanners like Three Shape, they can detect the shade, for example, uh, electronically. Maybe and, and you uh, and and tell us why you do or do not like powder. You said you don't like powder. Why? Is, uh, talk about that. Okay, powder is an extra layer that you put on top of your tooth or abutment or whatever. So uh, the more you spray, the more you add layer. The more you add thickness, the more you add inaccuracy in your final seating. That's one thing. Second thing is. Uh, Powder uh, is, is some, many times very hard to remove from the mouse, so it's, it's not something very user-friendly. And especially when it mixes with saliva, and some powders are very messy to move out. So th these are two uh, disadvantages that I don't like uh, powder for. Although, to be again uh, correct and to the point, any scanner, in order to scan something reflective, like for example brackets, uh, metal abutment, it needs to be sprayed, even the non powder ones. If you don't uh, mask the reflectivity of that object, it, it won't appear even with the powder uh, free scanners. So, Rami, in the United States, uh, I was part of the baby boob generation from 1945 to 1965. So, when you look at the distribution of the population, that, that was the big, it was kind of like a snake swallowing a rabbit, you know, it was the big lump. And they're retiring now at 10,000 per day, are retiring. And so dental implants are exploding. And then, yes. and then the baby boomers, uh, we were responsible for uh, kind of going from uh, gold and silver fillings to tooth colored, bleaching, bonding, veneers. We were the cosmetic revolution, and that's kind of coming down. Implants mm. is going up on the end. And then, and then we actually, America, starting in 2007, is starting what we call an echo boom. There were four and a half million babies born in 2007. So, so pedi so in America, pediatric dentistry is exploding on the on on the left, and implants is exploding on the right, and the mm. cosmetic stuff in the middle is coming down. And so, mm. a lot of these um, kids are um, very stressful about implant systems because. When they go to Cologne, there's like 175 <laughs> implant systems. And then, Rami, and then here's the other uh, very confusing things for the kids. Um, everybody in America who's placed 10,000 implants, they see a surgical guide as something that, you know, like training wheels on a bicycle. So they're like, yeah. I've, I've done 10,000. I've never used a surgical guide. Grow yeah. up and learn surgery. You got a tooth in front, a tooth behind. You got a buckle, lingual. If you can't figure, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then the young kids are like, um, you know, they like technology. They see the CBCT. They talk about surgical guides. So, um, so tell tell us this. Um, yeah. What implant system do you like? What what do you think they need to be computer guided? Do you, do you like uh, surgical guides? Do you like uh, CBCT treatment plan? Just start rating all that because I see your stuff on Facebook. You are a you are a unicorn. You really are. I mean, you're you've got to be the most amazing dentist in all of Egypt. And Ken Sirota thinks you walk on water. You know Ken Sirota? Uh, Ken, yes, Ken. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my friends, they just uh, they just think you're the most amazing. So so with all that rant... Um, there are there are many, 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 many good dentists in Egypt. So I am, I'm glad that we are, uh, we, we are showing this to the world. There are many people that I work with. A lot of what I do is teamwork from people from other specialties, and there are very top-notch international level dentists where I live. So it's not just me. I am the fruit of the work of many around me. Well, I hope you get you and all those guys to start putting some online courses on Dental Town. We, um, we put up, um, we got 217,000 dentists. It's 81% American. Um, and we've put up, I think, 350 courses and they've been viewed over 600,000 times. And Americans love anybody with an accent, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, they, it would be it would be so fun because most of all the implant stuff on Dental Town it's all Americans and it's uh, yeah. it's 81 percent Americans, 19 percent all yeah. the rest of the countries. But but it would be such an honor if you or any of your uh, Egyptian implant uh, gurus create an online CE course for us. But but what but talk about surgical guides, CBCT. Yes, that's a topic close to my heart. A topic where I spent a lot uh, of study and work on it. So that's a good question, and I am uh, ready to answer that. <laughs> okay. So uh, for me, let's take it uh, 
one step at a time. Today, doing implants without cone beam CT, that's something that uh, I don't know the, the debate of the standard of care in the US, is it there or not? But from my experience, Cone beam CT is very important even for single implants. And there are a lot of consensus papers that advise that too. So you need to have the cross section. If you don't have the third dimension, you are gambling a lot. And uh, from thousands and thousands of CBCTs that I saw, uh, a lot of stuff happened that we don't know that they happened or the, the, the bad stuff appears with time. So cone beam CT is very important. You have to have a modality that shows you the third dimension so that you can assess the width of bone, irregularities in anatomy. Every patient uh, is very specific and the anatomy can be very deceiving if you judge it only from 2D. So that's one part. So without cone beam, you are messing with your patients. If I'm a patient, I would never let a doctor do to me an implant without a cone beam. That's me. Okay, uh, let's take it another notch. Uh, virtual treatment planning for implants. It's very important because I need to have the teeth in the equation because at the end of the day, if I'm a patient and patients come because they want a tooth, they don't want an implant in bone. So I need to have what we call the prosthetically driven implant placement. We need to see where the crowns will be and accordingly uh, design our implants to give the best immersion, aesthetics, functions, so that our patients are happy. And doing virtual treatment planning for implants that way really minimizes the risk and uh, the surprises. Till now, I didn't mention surgical guides. So first is cone beam CT, two, prosthetically driven implant planning. These two, I, I think that they are overtaking and becoming mainstream now. Number three is the surgical guide. Uh, if you have one and two and you want to transfer them to the patient's mouth, you can do that in several ways. Uh, freehand, uh, like you said, you try to maneuver somehow and put your drill in the right spot. But if you are close to an anatomic structure that is very critical, I won't like to jeopardize myself if I'm a patient or jeopardize my patients if something is critical. So in, in high risk cases, I would advise using a guide that would do the full sequence and also uh, the depth control. Because some guides can do the initial pilot drill and then you continue freehand. So you don't have control, especially in soft bone. If you're in the maxilla or a soft bone, even in the mandible. Uh, like I, I had a friend, we did a case with the surgical guides, even, that's an extreme example. And he did everything very well and he was inserting the implants. And he, he, he put three, so he put the first, he put the second, he put the third and he was tightening the cover screw and the implant fell inside the bone. Because the quality of bone was very low and just by doing this it went into a space. So he was afraid, he thought it went into sublingual space, but it was combined in the bone. Maybe I'll show that in a lecture uh, or something on Dental Town one day. So uh, you, you need to have full sequence, depth control, and even guided implant insertion in critical cases. Like everything in digital dentistry and in dentistry, surgical guides can be oversold. They can tell you even monkeys can place implants. That's not true. <laughs> you need to have the proper know-how. You need to proper case selection because some cases need guides. For example, if you don't want to do stitching, open big flaps. Uh, but if you don't have enough bone, uh, you don't expect to do a flapless procedure and the guide would put in no bone. Like uh, some, some many times people tell me, uh, Rami, I have a case uh, that doesn't have bone. Can I use a surgical guide, please? I tell him, what are you saying? You don't have bone, you need to build bone, whether it's simultaneous, two-stage. So a surgical guide is a great tool when you use it in the right way, proper case selection. Uh, people who design it know what they are doing uh, and definitely the execution and knowing uh, all what can go wrong will help you uh, get the best out of it. I like surgical guides. I would use a surgical guide on me and on anyone uh, that uh, I, th I think is an important uh, person, which is all my patients and everybody's patients. Okay, um, so on the surgical guide, you don't want a surgical guide where it's just a hole. You want it on depth control. So exactly yes. what type of surgical guide uh, do you make? Is, it, is there a certain software or brand or? Into guide, IN number two guide. Is that at intoguide.com? Uh, it's ondemand3d.com because this is the name of the main software. Ondemand3d.com. Yes, that's a company based uh, both in uh, Seoul in Korea and in California. Is the so, company made in Korea? So is that so? What are the three Korean implants? It's um, it's um, 
Hi Austin. Um, there are a lot. There are a lot of Korean implants, not three. <laughs> yeah. What, what's it, what's the main Megagen? Meg, Megagen, Neobiotech, uh, Dentium, uh, Hi Austin, and many, many, many Koreans are booming uh, on on implants. And who just bought uh, Megagen? Was it Strawman? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Not, not sure. Okay. But you like the um um. What 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 is your website, by the way, for your for your lab? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I would prefer the Facebook page because it's, uh, Okay. What's your Facebook page? 3D vision, one word, imaging. 3D vision imaging. Yes. Uh, okay. and, oh, and we have another page, which is just 3D vision. Okay. And my third personal page, Rami uh, Gamil, because my Facebook account uh, is more than 5,000 now. I can't add more friends, so I make, I made a personal page. Okay, so so you got a, on Facebook.com forward slash either 3D Vision Imaging or 3D Vision or Rami Gamal. Yes, yeah, you you can write it in the search tab and you will find them. Okay, but you like the um you like the Surgical Guide Into Guide um which is made by uh, on demand 3D.com. Yes, because they have the full solution. They have the kit. Uh, and uh, I, I like to have a solution, not just one component. I like to have the software, uh, the, 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 the guide that is very well calibrated to it, that you don't do a lot of adjustments. But again, this is not to say that other systems won't work. You, if you know what you are doing, you can make it better. But I would say everyone to be cautious that anyone that comes and says, oh, life will be uh, like a click and all that stuff, that's partially true. It will be a click, but it will be a pain in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go back to so which CBCT do you like? Um. Uh, right now, um, mm -mm -mm. I like to use uh, Plan Mecca because there's a, I like the resolution and their artifact removal is very good when it comes to uh, uh, when there is metal in the scans. Uh, I think also. Uh, the, the Finnish other ones like Instrumentarium and Sordix are good and they are cheaper a little bit. Um, that's it. That's uh, that's what I would use. For so, so either just uh, Plan Mechas or Instrumentarium, those were your uh, two main leads? Yes, and uh, iCat is good, but it's just dedicated cone beam CT. I like to have the three in one, the, the, the cone beam and the Ceph and the OPG, the panorama. Okay, say that again. I that was the name of that was what? ICAT. Okay, so the ICAT. Say say that again. ICAT is 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 a good machine when it comes to cone beam, yes, but it's just dedicated CBCT machine. It, it doesn't have uh, Ceph or Panorama. They generate the Panorama uh, and the Ceph out of the CBCT, which for me is a, a less resolution than what you get from a Ceph sensor or a 2D sensor. So what do you think was a greater invention in the life of dental radiology? Do you think it was the CBCT or the guy who figured out on the pano to put an R on one side and an L on the other? Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. That's the only thing the patients ever recognize. They look at that pano and say, is that is that the right side? And I thought that yeah. is the greatest thing they ever invented. Um, so I want to throw you under a bus again. They – there's 175 implant companies. I mean, does your bone yeah. cell really care if the titanium says Nike or Adidas or Reebok? Or um, you, you were talking about implants should be prosthetically driven. That's why you like CBCT uh, uh, surgical guides. Yeah. Um, are any of them better from the prosthetic uh, surgical driven? Uh, are there any systems you have less uh, doctors that, that, that's easier for your referring doctors to use? Uh, people that where I work, they use everything: uh, Korean, uh, American, uh, European, uh, everything. So we, we use everything, whatever works good in your hand, whatever that has good uh, support, uh, good stock, and the prosthetic components, good connections. Uh, that's very important. So you're pretty agnostic when it comes to the actual titanium implants. Uh, yes, I am. Right. Um, so. Um, I can't believe it, man. That was the fastest. Uh, I only got you for five more minutes. It's already been 55 minutes. Uh, I'm probably not uh, smart enough to uh, be asking you the questions. What 
What question should I have been smart enough to ask you and I didn't ask you? Uh, good, good question, Howard. <laughs> or, or I could just go through uh, some uh, controversies in, uh, in uh, implants that uh, are, are big debates. Um, one of the problems in America is that most of the people who need implants is because they had a lot of um, bad healthy habits. They were smokers. They were, you know, uh, uh, some, hmm. some oral surgeons won't place an implant if you're a smoker. Other, other dentists say, God, if I didn't place implants on smokers, I wouldn't place any implants. Uh, will you place an implant on someone still currently smoking? Uh, he has to stop smoking for the period of the surgery. And uh, I would advise him from day one that smoking is a risk factor that might lead to uh, problems and failure of his implants. If he agrees, uh, I, I, I explain. <laughs> okay, some doctors are drawing blood and spinning uh, platelet-rich and all this stuff. And yeah, other, right. uh, other famous implantologists say that sounds all great in theory, but there's really no evidence that that helps. What, what would you say to that? For me, PRF is, uh, in my hands, works good with soft tissue healing. Uh, for bone, I really can't tell uh, if it really matters. And what bone are you using? What, when, when someone needs a bone grafting, what kind of bone are you using? Uh, we use uh, BioOS, we use uh, also f from Botus uh, some products. Uh, and Botus, for example, they have a very nice thing which is customized bone. Uh, we can do CBCT, we can plan uh, the shape of the graft and they can mill it and it will be customized. You open the flap, you attach it and you screw it and I think this is something very cool. So we're at the very end. Um, I think seeing Cairo and the pyramids has got to be on the top 10 vacation for any of the 10,000 dentists you're lecturing to right now. Um, if someone wanted to go see Cairo, they wanted to visit the pyramids, um, how long should that trip be? There's also a lot of uh, Mediterranean cruises out of Cairo. Um, what, 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 what is, what is, if someone went to Cairo, what, what are the must-sees? Uh, in Cairo, uh, the pyramids... The Egyptian Museum, uh, you, you need to see uh, the, the, the uh, places that ha are, uh, they have the old buildings in old Cairo, that's something very cool. Uh, in, in Egypt in general, Upper Egypt is, is magnificent, Luxor and Aswan with the temples and the weather in winter is amazing, it's very sunny. And the Red Sea is super for those who love the diving and everything. So we have different tastes according to everybody what he likes. So I would say a trip to Egypt in Cairo would be four days. And the Red Sea, three, four days. Upper Egypt, maybe four or five days also. So if you want to stay and see everything, maybe do seven, ten days, depending on if you can take that vacation easily. So four days in Cairo, four days on the Red Sea, and four days upper Egypt? That would be the, 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 the dream trip. Yes. Okay, Ryan, you want to go? Rami, Rami said that we can stay at his house the whole 12 yes. days. Done, done, done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I so uh, cannot wait to uh, go there. And uh, my, uh, my two of my boys, Greg and Ryan, are uh, itching to go to uh, Cairo. So uh, that won't be uh, long. Uh, so um, any, any last thing you'd like to tell the townies about uh, all your technology-driven mind? Uh. I would love to stay in touch with everybody. My email is uh, Rami, R-A-M-I, Gamil, G-A-M-I-L, at 3dvsolutions.com. Uh, uh, Facebook is easier to connect also. If you have any questions, please send me. Let's share cases. Let's do things together. Uh, let's join hands to do programs uh, that make digital dentistry uh, more uh, doable in every parts of the world. I'll be in Chile in August in, uh, in um, the 7th to 9th. We're doing a digital dentistry course. I'll be at New York University the, the 13th. Uh, I'll be in Romania uh, in October. So we'd love to see uh, many, many more friends and colleagues and do more digital cool stuff together. And definitely everybody's welcome in Cairo. We had a very nice... Uh, conference called the IDF, the International Dental Forum. We did it uh, in in uh, in uh, June. It was very good, and the next version will be super. And we will uh, love to have you with us. You mean the internet, the IDF, the Internet Forum group? Would they? No, no, no. no. I, I have a very good doctor. That's a very good friend. Uh, he is uh, a little, he's older than me. So when I told him the IDF, he told me the IDF, the forum on the internet. This is where I learned and shared and did a lot of stuff, but 
many of the people there either died or we don't do it anymore. So I told him, no, that's a different thing. But it was interesting that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the founder of that, um, Dental Town and IDF were both started in Phoenix. And the guy's name was uh, Dave Dodell, and it was, a, it was an email uh, server exchange. And now he's a teacher at a Midwestern Dental School. But it was uh, one of the first uh, – it, it was the first robust email internet dental forum. There, I used to be on there. There were thousands of the dentists. Impact, what? The impact of it reached Egypt. That's the story of one that is one of the very top dentists uh, in, in the older generation that I am that I learned a lot of. So he really liked that forum. He learned a lot uh, from it. And uh, we, we are trying to push more education at 3D Vision, whether as a training center or a convene center or a digital density center, and we invite people to come and learn and share. So uh, I, I love online sharing, live sharing, everything, making the world smaller and going faster and growing together. Well, hey, we, uh, we passed one hour, but uh, I forgot one question. Can I ask you an overtime question? Uh, for you, I would do anything. Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> smile design. Do you, do you think yes. technology is um, is really necessary in smile design? Uh, you're doing veneers, cosmetic work, all that stuff. What What, what are your thoughts on smile thank design? You, thank, thank, thank you, Howard. Three thank yous for that question. <laughs> really? Okay. Yes. Because I've been working lately for the past months on smile design. I've been doing lots of smile design cases uh, and. Uh, I, I, like I always said, uh, put your hands in, in real life. So I'm doing that for a while now to really see if it, the pros and cons, like everything I explained in that uh, hour. So for me, smile design, I first learned it in 2D by Christian Coachman. Uh, so, and before him, there was uh, Edward McLaren that did it in Photoshop, smile design, PSD. And smile design goes back to the principles of complete denture. It's a long thing. It's not just something that appeared. But thanks to Christian and others, it became mainstream in the last years. Uh, smile design, when we do it in 2D, we take 2D photos and we do the design. So uh, for the older generation, for them, this is very time consuming. Why take all that time drawing the teeth and everything? And in the end, you cannot transfer it to your CAT CAM machine, for example. So it takes a lot of time and just to communicate with the patient. So for them, it doesn't pay well. The second thing is when you try to merge the 2D photos with the models that are scanned with intraoral scanners or lab scanner. Again, to transfer from 2D to 3D, there are inaccuracies and they are very technique sensitive. Uh, like exactly when you're using a 2D to place an implant. There is a lot of guesswork. You try to match a 3D object over a 2D one, so problems might arise. So the accuracy, again, is questionable. The digital rulers that are used in, in 2D smile design are just a picture that you put on PowerPoint or Keynote and you calibrate. So if the patient looks up, down, left, or right, the image is distorted and the measurements are distorted. So that's something that needs to be taught, okay? Not just we talk about. Uh, for me, what, the transition to use 3D smile design from the beginning, which means you use a face scan instead of 2D photographies. There is a place for 2D photographies, but if you incorporate the 3D face scan, that's one thing. So from the beginning, you are designing in 3D. You have the model, the cone beam, and the face scan and you design the smile in an accurate way, and then you reproduce it uh, in CAT CAM, milling, or a mock-up, or whatever. And uh, I think this is the next step in smile design, take it to fully 3D, and in the future, I think the smile design needs to be more dynamic, not just static, even in 2D or 3D. And that's a work in progress we are working on. I think if you had half your brain removed, it'd still be twice as big as mine. <laughs> not necessarily, no. You are, you are the big guy. <laughs> and and no, no, I'm not. And and I'll tell you um, to my homies, remember, we do a transcript on all these podcasts because most Americans, uh, they they have an hour commute in their car to work, so they're listening to this. And if you're listening to this, don't just – I know that all went over your head, uh, but on, on Dentaltown we, where we post the podcast, we put on iTunes on sound. We put uh, sound only <clears throat> on YouTube. It's sound and video. But on Dentaltown, it's sound uh, or video. But with the transcript, and uh, because man, you uh, you were talking a million miles an hour, and that was a lot of information. And I hope my homies get to see you on an online CE sometime. I I think uh, I know you do a lot of stuff with Dental XP, but I just want to say uh, to the Dental XP boys that uh, all my homies they read several magazines. I don't know, I, I have a Dental Town magazine, but everyone I know reads a dozen magazines. Everybody I know. Uh, learns on Facebook, Dental Town, Dental XP, iTunes. So I, I never think in fear and scarcity. I always think in hope, growth, and abundancy. Uh, but anything to make dentists do dentistry 
better, faster, higher quality, and lower in cost. Keep one eye on the patient, one eye on cost. Use your God-given brain to drive down costs so you're so that humans have the freedom to afford their oral health, which really helps their mental health. And it has been a huge honor that you spent an hour with me. So it's it's 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning in uh, Phoenix. What time is it there in Cairo? Now it's 7, 10 p.m. And as you saw, uh, the light is going down. It's going to be dark now. <laughs> okay. And I, uh, I want to uh, lecture there so bad, uh, mainly just to spend 12 days there and all that stuff, meet you. But uh, so hopefully uh, next time I uh, get a lecture opportunity there, I'm going to take it. I, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> okay, buddy. Thank you so much. It's Rami Gamel. Thank you very much, Rami. Thank you, Howard. We'll catch up soon. Have a great day.